Live from the bedroom of nerds, Matt and I are back for another episode of the Less Is More Sports podcast. And Matt, even though we had to take the week off last week for reasons we won't get into, a lot has happened in the sports world. NBA mm-hmm. Summer League is in full effect. My Cardinals are on a six-game winning streak, which I know you just love to hear about. The middle of our lineup is starting to find the rhythm. I would have a bigger problem with it if we weren't if the Reds weren't ten games over five hundred and about three and a half back of the wild card. Just took a series with the Phillies, and uh, we're now going to beat up unceremoniously on the Chicago Cubs for three games. So, yeah, you all can have fun in third. I don't mind. Oh, he's already thrown out with the shade. I like it. But anyways, I mean, the middle of our the middle of our hitting lineup starting to get their groove. We got Flaherty back, so I mean, I think momentum's shifting in the right direction for us. Oh, and oh, yeah. but enough about a team we can disagree on. A team we can agree on officially began their 2021 campaign yesterday with the Indianapolis Colts. So before we get into the topic today, what you see? What did you like or dislike from the Colts uh, game against the Panthers yesterday? I thought it was a lot of fun. First, I usually watch a few preseason football games, even if they don't involve the Colts. And usually I just get bored by halftime. Like I tried to watch that Buccaneers and Bengals game on Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, this is terrible. And I turned it off about halfway through. But I don't know if it's because the Colts and the Panthers both resolved to basically play nobody. And when they did play somebody, play them only for like a series, if that. The, it, it felt more interesting, you know, watching P.J. Walker, formerly known as Philip Walker, who used to be a Colts quarterback, go back to Indianapolis. The Colts have a quarterback question. I don't even want to call it a controversy because God knows what who wins in Sam Ellinger versus Eason like that. But woof. But uh, it, it was actually one of the more fun preseason games I remember actually watching all the way through. Because I remember that one and the one where they sent Pat McAfee out to kick like a 75-yard field goal to win it. Mm-hmm. Those were my two favorite games because you could tell that they were just like, you know, let's have some fun out there. But I did like what I saw, especially, you know, Marlon Mack looked really good. I know it's not exactly the Panthers starters, but just having a guy like that back on the team and the roster, taking up carries, it's always a good thing to have. You can never have too many good running backs. So that was a positive. Alan Gurr, in, so, in spite of that interception, he played pretty well. Uh, Eason kind of started shaky and then settled into it a little bit so yeah the only thing I didn't like was when uh I think it was Kerry Wills went down and uh he's holding his knee and I was like well why are we starting this guy I don't like that and then they pulled all the defense so it didn't matter but yeah a lot of fun I like the way the Colts are structuring that defensive line it's not young but it's got a lot of good veterans on a lot of guys trying to prove themselves and I think that's gonna that's definitely gonna pay off in the pre in the regular season with some of the teams they play early, we're going to get a dose of Chris Carson and J.K. Dobbins and Lamar Jackson and guys who are just really speedy behind the line getting the ball upfield. So I like having veterans back there. And, I mean, I know it's their only home game of the preseason, but, yeah, it was a good game. I enjoyed it. I even enjoyed watching Eddie Pinheiro go out there and kick the game-winning field goal. So I I still don't know if I'm excited or not, but now that they've changed the tune on Carson Wentz being available week one, I mean, it, it – it was just a good game to watch. It was just a nice way to spend a Sunday afternoon. So those are my thoughts. I agree. It was a very fun preseason game to watch, which, like you said, you don't get a lot of in the preseason because it's a lot of guys just wanting to prove themselves and make the final 53-man roster. But you actually touched on the two things that stood out to me the most. Number one, of course, uh, first thing I'll mention is Marlon Mack. I wasn't expecting him to have maybe a lot of big runs in this game. But what I coming off an Achilles injury, I was looking about how he felt, how he looked like he felt out there. He looked very explosive, which was a good sight to see. Like you said, he's not going to have to be the main guy anymore. You got Jonathan Taylor, you have Naheem Hines, just another guy to at least kind of limit the wear and tear on our other two guys and then still be productive out of the backfield. He looked very explosive, and I was good for us to see. Another thing I want to say is, I know the news coming out about the availability of Quentin Nelson and Carson Wentz. I will say, though, if Carson Wentz can't go week one or even farther, I'm not as worried as I maybe would have been because I really liked 
like you said, Easton got off to a shaky start. But when he settled in, especially in the two-minute drill, I really liked what I saw. And it's funny with this quarterback competition because the two of them are almost polar opposites. Easton's the mm-hmm. traditional pocket passer with the big arm. Ellinger is more of the modern mobile quarterback where he doesn't have a big arm, but he makes up for it in timing, and which is what he showed in that preseason game. Doesn't not, may not have the highest velocity behind his passes, but dude gets it out on time and on target. So I liked what I see. Um, Ellinger is getting the start against the Vikings next week, so we'll see what he does and the starting role. So I'm optimistic. I'm remained optimistic even with the Carson Wentz injury and even through the Quentin Nelson injury, even though it was a little harder to do so. But yeah, I'm still optimistic about the season. I'm going to blame you for being that way. And I mean, Paris Campbell, that was another bright spot for me with that big couple of big catches in that game, especially with the way he's been hurt over the past couple of years. If he can get healthy and do that in the regular season with Pittman and Hilton, that receiving core may not be as sorry as like a lot of people think it is because there's a lot of speed there. A lot of speed. Paris Campbell is, I've said once, I've said before, I'll say it again. Paris Campbell is going to be the X factor on our offense this year. His health is going to determine how scary our offense can look, regardless yep. of who the quarterback is. With you can't teach that kind of speed and you that cannot. kind of yeah, and that kind of playmaking ability. So just getting the ball in his hands, even as a decoy or whatever, is just another weapon that the opposing team is going to have to defend against. Mm-hmm. But tr- our last transition to b- before we get into the next, the, our topic of the show is. I just want to tell our viewers that when you, you, the USA basketball team lost to Nigeria, I told everyone, and I quoted somebody that we uh, talked about on our previous show, quoting Aaron Rodgers by saying, R-E-L-A-X, relax. And what happened when we relaxed? Gold medal, baby. That's all that matters. People were ready to throw away that team, say that they were embarrassment to USA basketball. Well, they turned it around one gold. So you all were the ones that's wrong, not me. Just want to throw Great that out. Great acting, playing defense like in the middle of a casino somewhere. So that vi- have you seen that video of him yes. like doing like Greg Popovich, man? Don't do that. You're like 80 years old. You'll break your back. <laughs> we'll say, but. No, all that transitioning into what Matt and I are going to discuss today. And for those who have been following, the most decorated, sorry, I got the word wrong, the most decorated sporting event in the world just concluded. The six-week event known as the Olympics. And you know what? I'm going to be completely honest. I didn't get to see a lot of it. I had to work a lot through it. But the main thing is that the USA came out on top with the most gold medals. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. But the main, where we get into the topic of today's show is, look, I don't know about you, Matt, but when I was growing up, when the Olympics were on, that was it. Everyone almost stopped what they were doing, turned on the Olympics, followed every event, and it was, and just to see what was going on. It was, it was that one time every four years that we all come together just to watch our country perform at the highest event, at the highest level. But this year kind of felt a little different. It almost yeah, seemed yeah. like not as many people were interested. And Matt, do you, do you have anything on why that might be? You know, the, the Olympics has always been an interesting thing for me because Unlike you, I never remember a time in my life where I actually did stop and watch the events or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I've always been kind of like a get the highlights if they matter from like something else or on Twitter. I've never actually spent the time to just stop and watch swimming. I mean, I know these people for the United States are great athletes. They're top of the line athletes, but it's never really interested me like interested me in that way. I've never really had an interest in the Olympics. And then you take like a year like we had in this country and worldwide with COVID, with all the unrest we've experienced, and it kind of put a damper on things. It's You read these reports that not even the people of Japan wanted the Olympics there this year because they were afraid of the spread of COVID. You think about your own country, you think about all the stuff you've been through, and it's kind of like, 
you know, I'm not really in the mood for a giant world party right now. It seems like it's kind of out of place in like the current environment we're in is just how it felt. It just didn't feel like it was an Olympic mood. And when you didn't weren't really into the Olympics anyway, it just kind of felt, dare I say, unnecessary. The last year kind of put like the entirety of the world and America's place in it and the worldwide and the global citizen type perspective into a whole new light. And it made things look really, really weird. And so I was watching the Olympics and it's like, COVID is wrapped still out there. The people didn't want this in, in a coast country. It feels kind of weird to enjoy it, you know? Like, I, I'm enjoying watching people dunk and while having good basketball games in the dead of summer. But at the same time, it's like, huh. After the past year we had, I really don't feel like celebrating. And I know that's not what they're trying to do. They're not trying to force it on anybody. And they're not trying – and the point of the Olympics is to be like a global celebration. But it just didn't really feel like a celebratory mood this year. There are still a lot of question marks. There's still a lot of deep – reflections of ourselves going on and you know i had never seen the united states basketball team take on so much criticism as when they lost to france in that opening round game it was almost like well there's no point in watching the olympics now because they suck and it was just like hmm it i don't know if it was just the year that was or kind of like the the questioning of the american identity if you will but it just really didn't feel like a celebratory, happy Olympics to me. And I think that's part of the reason why I really wasn't that interested in it. On my end, some of the great Olympic athletes that I grew up with, Michael Phelps, Usain Bolt, they weren't in it. So for me, I didn't have as much interest because mm -hmm. I didn't really know a lot of the players or a lot of the competitors or a lot about them. Had not, don't, hadn't really built any memory, at least – watching them so and it was hard enough to watch like I said to be able to sit down and watch it with my work schedule but with no Phelps or no Bolt or no Michaela Maroney or any or anybody like that and not not to mention with the whole Shikari Richardson deal that happened you know we and uh, Simone Biles which I 100 who I 100% support her yeah, decision yeah. but Simone is I'm just going to say it, and I don't care if this is controversial at all. She is the greatest gymnast that's ever lived. So with her out of the picture, I really didn't feel any urge to watch gymnastics because, you know, I, 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 I want to see greatness. Yeah, I want to see greatness, period. She's a superstar. But to allude to what you said, though, it would almost – you would almost think that it would have the opposite polar effect. Yes, I agree with everything what you just said, but at the same time, I would have – at least could have expected kind of like when the saints won the super bowl post Katrina or something yeah. like that. We just came through a global pandemic there at least, well, okay. If we want to get real technical with the Delta variant and all that going on, we, but at least seemingly like we were coming, we were seeing light at the end of the tunnel that the Olympics could have been that event to give, um, to give us a reason to celebrate post COVID, but it just didn't have that effect. And I want to load to another point that you had. And even though in the 2012 and 2016 Olympics, social media was a, a very prevalent thing as well. But the more we progress, the more social media takes its toll on society roles. And what I mean by that is everything's just so quick and easy and highlights. You don't necessarily have to sit down and watch the Olympics now when you can just check Twitter and see um, – yeah, so and so yeah. win the four hundred. Uh, yeah, see the gold medal or the or whatever. So I think that I think that also plays another role in um actually viewership is that you don't have to watch the entire event; you can just see everything you need to see online. But I want to bring I want to ask this question to you: and is there any? Do you think there's any lack of country pride that we have going on nowadays? I mean, it could be that a little bit, too. Like I said, that's part of the self-reflection thing I was talking about. The past year with, like, the murder or murder. Yeah, let's let's go with that. With, like, the George Floyd incidents and things like that. The whole, you know, mask up, mask down controversy and things like that. I think there were a lot of people who were feeling kind of, like, jaded or confused about what it meant to be an American. I don't think there was a lot of, like, overwhelming national pride. 
You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. there was a lot, there were some, there were some cracks in the foundation that got really got put in a new light this year. Mm-hmm. And so I don't really know if that applies to our athletics at all, to be honest with you. I'm just thinking about strictly from like a socioeconomic and social standpoint that maybe there was a different kind of view on like what the Olympics mean, what, and I know this is really, a, not really a topic that sports shows deal with a lot, unfortunately, but you know, like how we treat athletes as a reflection of ourselves in some way, like you said, even the Simone Biles thing, think about the reaction that got from like different sides of the press where you had people who were like journalists on some side, on some sides of the aisle calling it a, like a national disgrace. And it's like that happened during the Olympics. I don't understand why you would post, why you would even write that, number one. And then, you know, just the past year, and, you know, questioning things like that and what do people have pride in the country anymore? And, you know, is a swimming competition enough to bring that back? Mm-hmm. And I think after a year as traumatizing and long and frankly brutal for some people as it was with the protests and the, and the contested election and everything like that, that uh, I can't blame anyone for feeling a little bit down on themselves or feeling like, you know, maybe it's not as great as you thought it was. Especially like you said, when you were a kid, the heroes of the past that we grew up with, your your Kobe's, your uh, Michael Phelps, and, you know, got Usain Bolt, you know, he's Jamaican. People like that are gone. This is a new era of, you know, trying to figure out your place in the world. I think in a way... The passing away, or passing away, they didn't, well, tragically Kobe Bryant, but the movement away from those athletes we watched in 2010 and 2016, it kind of reflects what we're going through as a generation in some ways, you know? We get up there, we grow up with these heroes, these amazing people who we want to idolize and be part of, and then we have a year like 2020 where we question everything, the fabric of our society, the role of politicians, the role of law enforcement everything like that. And then we are here in the Olympic athletes at the time reflect that, you know, we've got people like, we've got people making statements. We have the Olympics banning certain uh, garments that endorse political positions like Black Lives Matter. You've got the Simone Biles incident. I think it's a good microcosm of what like our entire generation has been through since 2016. You know, watching like the rise and then kind of like, a slight decline and then 2020 happens and everything kind of falls apart. So I think that definitely has a part of it. I don't know if it's a lack of national pride. Well, I don't really think it is because, you know, a lot of people still to turn up for USA basketball. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of a, it's more of a reflection on the age that we're in the age that like the generation like ours is coming into mm-hmm. where like the old generation is like in clear. What's the word I'm thinking of in like clear objection to what's coming the younger generation is still not taking its place yet and then there's us kind of caught in the middle with like a questioning sense of what our place is you know Mm -hmm. wondering what the future holds after like coming up with such heroes coming up watching Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps in Beijing in 20 in 2008 and kind of just wondering what's coming next I feel like that played a part of it too it's like you know we're kind of trapped in like this weird limbo of like where we think we know the answers, but we're afraid to act on them and things like that. So I would definitely say that it plays a small role in that, that kind of like questioning the national identity, questioning where we're going. So I think in a way the Olympics exemplified that in a way, maybe subconsciously we didn't pick up on. I want to touch on another thing you said, and because I know you hear it on social media, I know you hear it from those in the community, but we live in an an age today where we are seeing athletes become more vocal of things that are going on outside of sports, and it gets mixed emotions. You know, some people are all for it. I'll be, before we even get into that topic, I'm all for it. I'm one to respect everyone's opinion and that these athletes are human beings and that they have a right to voice what's going on in their communities. But you also have the other side of the argument where people don't like that, where people view sports as a way to escape from what's going on in the real world. And they don't want the two to mix. Do you think that that play that that played any factor in the Olympics getting less um, attention maybe this year than in years past? Oh, certainly. I have no question about that one. I saw a post about um, 
from somebody on Twitter that it's like, I hope that China kicks the USA's ass in the Olympics to prove to all these woke athletes that, and then it kind of went on for a bit, and I forget what the point was, but it's like, you're really rooting for China, who you like, I looked at the guy's Twitter page out of more of a curiosity, who you claim to absolutely despise, but you want them to beat us in athletic events because reasons? Because athletes said something you didn't like? And to me, that was just absolutely ludicrous. But I would, it would be kind of, it would be dishonest to say that that did not play a role. No, because I've seen a lot of people who are like, I wish these people would shut up and kick the ball, you know, shut up and dribble, shut up and do X, Y, Z. And then they just root for somebody else. And it's like, why do you claim to love the country and you don't like the people in or you don't like the people representing it? I understand certain aspects of it because some of them I, you just encounter on a daily basis. Some of the arguments make sense. And then you just have the bad faith arguments about certain aspects of it. Like, you know, they just shouldn't talk, say anything about them because they play for the country. It's like, well, people have criticized other people in like the United States for a very, very long time. You would be surprised what some people who were considered founding fathers said about the country in like 1795. So uh, slow your roll with that. It's not like no one's criticized anything before. But yeah, I would say definitely. I don't know why it is that people have taken such an adverse reaction. I think it's a little bit because of the anxiety, like the social economic stuff, you know. This rich person is telling me what I'm doing wrong and I'm barely scraping by and I think I want to I want to take care of the country my own way. And you know what? I, I get that. I do. It's kind of, you don't like it when someone who's like you're better economically or physically, you know, and I say that in air quotes, is just picking at you. You don't like that. So you kind of have a pushback to it. You feel like you're being bullied, but you're not. It feels like bullying because it's something different than what you're used to. In reality, it's just an attempt to show you a different perspective. And that's a very hard thing to do is to have the perspective of another person when you're in a different environment. It's very hard to do that. that empathy. It's very hard to just conjure up out of thin air. And I get that. But at the same time, I don't really think the solution to the problem is you ranting about it on Twitter and saying that you hope China kicks the USA's ass. But I do think that like the political, the political divide in this Olympics was a lot stronger than it was even in 2016 or anywhere before that. And I mean, we boycotted the Olympics as before because of where they were held. So that says a lot. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said the political divide, because we have a lot of that going on in today's society. And I think, it, and like you said, it is more so than ever, politics are transitioning to sports. And a certain thing that you said that almost just gave me nightmares, just thinking about it, is the phrase, shut up and dribble. I, I cannot stand that phrase. And not only that, I cannot stand the context of when Laura Ingram made that statement because yes. the whole context behind that was, and if you remember, she made that comment about LeBron James because he spoke out against Trump. First of all, I'm all for respecting the president who is in office, but that is not to say that they walk on water at the same time. If you have an issue with what things they do, we all speak out about it. That's part of being a human. That's part of being an American. I get it. Our definitions of what a patriot is, is not the same. They're depending on who you ask. Right. But there are different ways to show pride in your country and be a patriot. And just, you don't do it a certain way that does not make you any less of a patriot. I want to get that off my chest. Also number two, and to continue on what, with what Laura Ingram said, as if the statement she made, that entire segment was just dead wrong not any factually anything factually correct about the statement she made about LeBron James or Kevin Durant were factually true at all. And she never even said why they were wrong. She pretty much just called them stupid the entire segment and that they need to shut up and not speak out against, a, against the president or whatever. And that because they play basketball, they're not allowed to, to have a political opinion, which I, I disagree with that alone. But now you fast forward two years. When Drew Brees made the statement about kneeling during the anthem, yeah, all yeah. of a sudden, did you see her reaction? All of a sudden, the yeah, shut yeah. up and dribble flipped to, well, he's a person. He's got he some work. Yeah, he should have an opinion. 
Wait, 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 wait. Wait, Laura. I'm pretty sure you just said two years ago, but because two ath or two individuals are athletes, they should not have an opinion. Now you have one that agrees with your narrative, and all of a sudden he's allowed to have an opinion. And my point by saying this is not to even is not to bash one side or the other. It's to say it's to simply be the one thing that I ask everyone to do, whether it's sports, politics, or whatever, and that's be consistent. Either yes. you like athletes speaking out or you don't. Or you don't. And it, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter what the, their uh, what their narrative is, or okay, I'll, within reason. But it yeah. doesn't matter maybe what side of the fence they're on. If they share an opinion, you either like it or you don't. But you don't base that off what fits your narrative. And that is the constant yeah. issue that I'm always that we're always running into. And a lot of that is due to the divide we have in our political divide that we are almost getting molded to take within this country and that it's that we have to do things a certain way certain and if way. we don't we're wrong yes. and it's, and and it's reality compromise absolutely yes and it's almost taken and it's transitioned to sports and into the olympics so i think it is absolutely yeah so i agree with you i think it is absolutely fair but i do want to go ahead and say that me personally i don't mind if somebody speaks out i don't care what narrative they what side of the fence they're on if they are speaking out to express concern of what's going on within their country i don't care if they're democrat republican independent green party i don't care you yeah. have that right i respect that i may not agree with you but that does not change the fact that you have the right to say it and so from people like me it does not affect but some people it does and what i often see too and it, and i'm coming full circle with this is that people people only seem to have an issue with that when an athlete speaks out that doesn't fit their narrative. And I'm not just blaming one party for that. It's both. I've seen it on both sides. And that's where I ask people to be consistent. Either you respect athletes speaking out or you don't. Right. Because that don't be a hypocrite, basically. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, Les, can you pause the recording? I need to make a call real quick. Okay. All right. But uh, yeah, like kind of what we were talking about before the pause. Um, yeah, don't be a hypocrite. Yeah, don't. But unfortunately, like we mentioned earlier, we just see too much of that within our society to uh, fit one side or the other. One side's okay, always right. One side's always wrong and vice versa. And it's just tra it's transitioned to right, and it's transitioned everywhere, and I don't like it. I'm hoping that within the next four years we can finally give some kind of peace, but I think that's wishful thinking. And like set yeah. simmer down and get back to the way things were, both on the floor and off the floor. But I think that's wishful thinking. So, but anyways, um, from what I did see of the Olympics, they were they were exciting. Mm -hmm. um, no, really. We had a, uh, no really like historic performances that I'm aware of. I could be wrong. No, I can't think of any off the top of my head either. There were a lot. I mean, I think Italy won like their first gold medal or something. Mm -hmm. The funniest part from the Olympics that I remember were uh, the horse that wouldn't jump over the. Uh, <laughs> and the woman's just on the poor horse and she's crying and it's just sad. It's like that horse is not jumping over those, that barrier. He is staying put. Mm -hmm. And it's like somebody, that poor horse. And the other funny thing was Carl Lewis absolutely mm -hmm. roasting the men's relay team on Twitter. That was hilarious. Oh my gosh. I was... laughed. I'm just like, whoa. And like Carl Lewis knows a thing or two about running. And he also knows a thing or two about failing. If you've ever heard his national anthem. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And I mean, it was just hilarious. He's like, the baton handling is all wrong. I could have constructed a better team. That's like, whoa. Okay, Carl. Okay, because you know it's it's one thing if like some guy who was like the last leg runner on like the 1945 Olympic team was like doing this, but this is Carl Lewis, who like we said back in the day was one of the big stars of track and field, and he's going in on you, and it's like, oh no. So that, that those were my two favorite parts of the Olympics: were the horse that wouldn't jump and Carl Lewis just absolutely going in. Of course, we all know my favorite part about the Olympics is that the USA came out on top with the most gold medals. If you ain't, and to quote Ricky Bobby, if you ain't first, you're last. And that's just all I have to say about that. 
that's terrible advice. You could come in first or second or third, even fifth. Like, you mean fifth. I love that. I love Ricky Bobby is one of the best. Talladega Nights is just one of the best comedy movies I've seen, period. I know I knew we couldn't make a full podcast without making one movie reference. We have to. That's like that's why people watch. They don't care about the sports or <laughs> us trying to get semi political. They only want to know what movie we're gonna reference this week. So next week uh will be our full review of the Suicide Squad on streaming platforms now. So Oh, we're gonna do that next week? I thought we were about to get into that now because I, I've seen it. Have you not seen it already? I have seen it. So it was much better than the first one. Much better. See, I disagree. I think the first one was better, personal opinion. Really? Mm-hmm. How can you do that to King Shark? He was he saved the movie. Oh, King Shark definitely saved the movie, but I feel like there was just more drama with the first the first one. This one was just more of like, I mean, it it kind of felt like Deadpool meets DC in a way, which I get that's kind of what um Suicide Squad is. But yeah, I mean, it was very very colorful, I give it that. And um also, I, 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 yeah, I can't get over the starfish. I don't know. That's the whole reason why I watched that movie is because Starro was one of the first comic book villains I remember thinking was really cool. And it's just like, they're going to put that thing into a movie? I got to watch this. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I watched it and I was not disappointed. I thought it was great. And like we said, King Shark, God bless King Shark. Oh, he There's made the movie. Many bird. That part killed me. It's like, stay off the mic. And of course, who could forget? He just wanted nom nom. He just wanted nom nom. Monster nom nom? That was the best line in the entire damn movie. That or fake mustache. <laughs> just re- that character was just so pure. But I do agree with that. It was kind of like if Guardians of the Galaxy could curse. Yeah. That, that's a good vibe for it. So, But that's what you get when you get James Gunn. So... Well, there's our movie review for the week. Without, right spoiling, our- without spoiling anything else, um, I, I do have to say that um, they didn't have to do my boy Weasel like that, but... <laughs> you just sat me next to a werewolf? No, he's not a werewolf. He's a weasel. And he's harmless. <laughs> no, he's not harmless. He killed like 27 kids, but... Oh man, I would give them. I gave that movie a solid eight out of ten. I thought it was pretty good. So, I respect your opinion, but I disagree. But it's okay. That's fine. That's fine. It was a fun time, but I I like the first Suicide Squad better. Personal opinion. It just felt like a three hour long commercial for Hot Topic to me, but <laughs> that's because I didn't know anything about Twenty One Pilots or anything. I'm like, man. All I'm waiting for is for like someone to say, all of this merchandise available at your local Hot Topic. You got I, can't the, tell you. I bet they sold. I bet they uh, sold Enchantress at Hot Topic the very next day when the movie released too. Probably, I can think of a couple reasons why, but uh, this is a family podcast, so we're gonna keep moving. Yeah, we're so gonna keep moving. We've done the political commentary. We've done the movie review. What's next? I think it's our top five events that used to be relevant, but aren't so much anymore. And to avoid giving the same answers, I am going to give my top five Olympic events that aren't as popular in today's age as they used to be. While Matt is going to give his top five sporting events that are not, do not seem to have the same feel as they used to. So Matt, who goes first, me or you? Uh, let's have you to keep the Olympic theme going, and then I'll wrap it up in a nice little bow. Sounds good. Now, my number five for the Olympics may be because I was kind of a nerdy kid. Well, hell, I'm even a nerdy adult. And I thought it was so cool. I thought it was so cool as a kid. But fencing. I used to love watching fencing in the Olympics. And now, like, no one talks about it. Now it's I remember like me and my friends would even like act like we're fencing with like our pencils and our, or our rulers in school and stuff like that. And now I guess it just doesn't seem as cool when you get to be an adult. So I, yeah, I, I think fencing doesn't have the same feel to it. Uh, my number four, I'm going to have to go with, um, I'm going to have to go with swimming. 
for me, and this is, and I would be lying if I said this was 90% not, if this wasn't 90% impacted by Michael Phelps. Because I felt like when Michael Phelps was racing, not only is he the, in my opinion, the greatest individual athlete that has ever walked the planet. Um, he, when Phelps was racing, we all know he was the best. But there is just so much competitiveness to try to knock off Phelps with, between Lo even Lochte within his own country or LaCro uh, LaCroix or however you pronounce his name, the guy from, I think, France a few years back that, yes, the guy who danced in front of him and then the, the famous Michael Phelps Savage Mode meme came out yeah, and then yeah. Phelps like destroys him and then like waves his finger at him. See, I, we didn't we don't get many of those moments anymore because I feel like I feel like everyone's trying to reach the next Phelps, but they're just, it's just an unsuccessful unsuc attempt right now because I'm sorry, there's only one Michael Phelps and that's it. There's only one. There's only one. Um, my number three, it's going to be a similar theme and it's gymnastics. I feel like with the loss of Simone Biles, which I can't stress enough, I side with Simone Biles. Your mental health is important. And people watching this podcast who disagree, you're wrong. Your mental health is all of that. And so I side with Simone. But with that being said, the Olympics, I mean, the gymnastics event just didn't have the same feel to it. Because like I said, we're missing greatness. So yeah. I'm gonna be, not going to, and not also, and also the whole controversy with how she's judged too. It was, I remember I saw the comparison that said, can you imagine if, Michael Jordan hits a jump shot and he only counts as, and it only counts as one. Or if uh, Tom Brady scores a touchdown and only counts as four and they're only getting those points deducted because of their greatness. Well, that's how they judge Simone Biles. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's very true. And I think, I think it's very sad to hold something against someone because they're great. It's like, well, I'm sorry that they've worked their entire life to get to this point and be as good as they are, but now let's punish them for it. Great idea. <laughs> That's a great idea. That way they'll work harder. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to, you know, my list is going to go pretty quick um, because it's just short and sweet answers. Uh, number two is wrestling for me. I feel like wrestling was a much bigger deal. And maybe that even dates back to like when Kurt Angle won his gold medal with the broken neck or broken neck. Yes. And, you know, those storylines there. I mean, we had some great story uh, storylines this year, you know, with the first woman, uh, with our U.S. women's uh, wrestling champion, you know, hats off to her. And, you know, but I just don't think it has the same feel to it. Um, and my number one, and this might be the most controversial because this is, probably, uh, this is probably the one that was one of the events that was the most watched in this Olympics, but track and field. I think it's partially without yeah, yeah. someone like Bolt or uh, Tyson Gay in the mix. But I think a lot of, but majority of the reason it didn't have the same feel to it this year is because of everything that was going on with Shikari Richardson, who I side with 100% too. So what? She smoked a blunt. whoop de doo Anyone who has ever smoked weed can tell you it's not going to help you win a race. And no. that was the, that was the, I understand there is a drug, there is a drug policy in place with the Olympics, but also they need to be modernized. They need to yeah. understand the times that they're in. And the part that made me upset about it the most is that they tried to classify it as a PED. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? That, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean, any, I mean I'm, I'm not here to, like, bash anyone who smokes weed or anything, but, like, you're not no. going to smoke a blunt and all of a sudden break world record 400-yard uh, dash times or anything no. like that or 100-meter 100 uh, meter race times. I mean – that's just not Ridiculous. how that works. But yeah, that, I mean, and I, I think with that controversy, it took some wind out of the sails of the, of uh, the uh, track events. So yeah, like I said, short and sweet, those are my top five. And uh, if you have any comments on mine, I know I'm, I'm sure I'd love to hear them. Well, no, I think you nailed the head. I think you hit the, head the head with the, with the number one pick perfectly. It's that the problem with track and field is that, the biggest superstar wasn't even in the race, and she was a superstar because of a controversy. It wasn't like we had a Carl Lewis or a Ben Johnson or a Usain Bolt. It was just controversy about, you know, weed and drug policies and, you know, 
Heck, of all the things for the president of the United States to weigh in on, that was the thing he weighed in on, saying those are the rules. Like, whoop-de-doo, that doesn't mean they should still be the rules. So I, I think you hit the nail on the head perfectly with basically all of them. Is that Part of what makes the Olympics, and I'm going to get into this with my list a little bit, part of what makes the Olympics the Olympics is, that, like, the day you turn it on, and they do like like, a, like those 30 minute like breaks in between each sport and you're watching it and they're giving you some sob story about this kid who like, you know, when he was five, his puppy got run over by a car and then he had to go out and, you know, he lost a thumb to a garbage disposal and he's now like the number one skeet shooter of Norway. And that's part of what draws you in. And that was a very weird analogy, but you know what I'm saying? They, they, they reel you in with these kind of sob stories throughout the course of the year, these stories of like triumph and they build their own superstars for the Olympics. And this time that really didn't happen. There really wasn't a singular superstar who was participating in games who you were like hooked into, invested, who became like the embodiment and going back to a topic we had earlier, who became the embodiment of like the American spirit, if you will. Mm -hmm. It was kind of just like, you know, athletes are there, they're doing what they can. And, you know, like there's there's no like every man or every per every woman who's overcome everything that you can relate to. You know, I don't relate to Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant is a skinny, multimillionaire, amazing athlete. I'm a fat guy in the bedroom of nerds. <laughs> I, I, I don't relate to that. Uh, and without like that's without like those stories building into like the narrative of creating the superstar, I think that does detract from the Olympics. So I would one, I wholeheartedly give your list the stamp of approval. And it may change in about four years, but until that point, it really doesn't because, you know, no one's going to care about track and field for the next three and a half years. I'm sorry, track and field enthusiasts. Uh, the, the time has come to anoint the next Usain Bolt or someone of those means. and Or, you know, Allison Felix, she was in this Olympics mm -hmm. and it didn't feel like she was. They didn't play her up and she's one of like the best runners ever mm -hmm. in American track. So, I mean without that narrative of building up the star to being the every man, every champion that you need, it does kind of feel empty. I'm not going to lie. So yeah, I would 100% agree with everything you said. That list gets the stamp of approval. I'm glad I got the stamp of approval in the bedroom of nerds that my, uh, my podcast uh, segment is complete for the day, but now we are on for your list. All right. So because Les did the Olympic events, I'm doing the Olympic or not Olympics, the Olympics is not on my list. Neither is the World Cup, which should surprise some of you. But I think the World Cup is on the come up in American culture because we're becoming more and more diverse. We're becoming more and more invested. And we have a guy named Christian Pulisic who is out there killing it for Chelsea. So I think the World Cup is actually going to slowly make its way up in Americans' pantheon of sports. It may not get to the point of the NFL, but, you know, a, yeah. 5,000 or 5 million people watching the World Cup in America would be a very big success. So I'm going to exclude that for now. But what about the events in sports that slowly are kind of losing their luster through one way or another? So this is my top five. And I'm going to start off a bit controversial, but I have a reasoning why. And for number five on my list of sporting events that are kind of losing their luster, won't matter as much or don't matter as much anymore, I am putting NFL Thanksgiving football specifically. And this is not an indictment on the NFL, even though, let's be honest, the past few matchups have been pretty lousy. I mean, last, last year we had the Lions and the Texans when they were both out of it. We had the Cowboys, who at that point in the season were just treading water due to injury after injury. And once again, to bring in our recurring theme of the day, COVID-19 canceled the Steelers and Ravens game. But that's not why I'm saying this. I'm not saying this because of anything the NFL has done. The NFL has done everything correctly. I am saying this because I believe that Thanksgiving as a holiday is not on the come up. It is going down, especially for people in our generation and getting younger. When I ask people what their least favorite holiday is of like the major ones, I'm not talking about Arbor Day. I'm not talking about President's Day. I'm not talking about National Talk Like a Pirate Day. <laughs> the major holidays where you get a day off. Thanksgiving routinely is the bottom of the barrel. People don't like being around like extended family who kind of creep them out. They don't like being trapped in a house that's not theirs all day. They don't like eating food that they're not used to anymore. 
they just don't like it, period, end of statement. And I don't really blame them for that. If there's anything I'm kind of glad that ge our generation's picked up on, it's that, and I know Dom Toretto is going to burst through my wall now because I'm about to say this, but it's that family is not just your genetics. Family is also a little bit of who you choose to love and who chooses to love you. And that's great because sometimes blood family can be pretty darn toxic. Uh-oh, Dom Toretto's here. Sorry. <laughs> It's the end. Don't turn your back on family. I turned my back on family. I got. I'm going for a ride in the. I'm going for a ride with Dom now. I'm in big trouble. But uh, I think that the decline of Thanksgiving and the fact that you know everyone loves the Cowboys. Nobody loves the Detroit Lions. Lions fans, you can prove me wrong. I know, but nobody loves the Detroit Lions. But I think it's more to do with the decline of Thanksgiving into an over commercialized, unbeloved holiday that NFL Thanksgiving football has just kind of lost its luster because now more people at four o'clock are lining up for the sale at Best Buy than they are to watch the Cowboys and the Washington football team. And that's nothing to do with the NFL. That's not the NFL's fault. This is not Roger Goodell's fault. They're still one of the better run sports leagues. But my point is that in a couple of years, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some frankly just atrocious ratings for Thanksgiving football games. Number four, and it pains me to say this because before, this before you get that, before you get that, can I say something about your number five though? Um, I, I agree with what you just said. And I think this is also going within like commercializing in society is that Thanksgiving has almost been taking away from the values of getting with family and sitting down, having a meal together and watching football. And it's almost becoming like black Friday Eve at this point. Uh, yeah. Everyone wants to hop in line for their best deals. And I'm not a fan. I've never been a fan of black Friday. Um, I really don't feel like being trampled to get $20 off of a TV that I um, probably am still getting what I'm paying for anyway. See, I knew I were, I have a lot of friends that worked in retail. And one thing they, thing they have always told me is you're getting what you're paying for. You're not getting a deal. So sorry to spoil anyone's Black Friday hopes and dreams on the podcast, but you are getting what you're paying for. If you are getting a TV on it for a good price, there is something probably wrong with it. It's just reality. It's business. It's smart business, but it's business at the same time. And for me personally, I and do, do enjoy eating turkey and mashed potatoes and mac and cheese while watching. I don't care what uh, how good the teams are, the Lions and the Cowboys and Bears, oh my, and shit like that. But um, yes. But yes. I like but, how you um, did that. <laughs> I, had, I had the word play a little bit but uh yeah so i just wanted to add that to um to to your number five so i didn't mean to i didn't mean to cut you off oh it's totally fine if you want to do it again just no um, no you did it once that's enough let me talk okay. for the next 15 minutes okay all right cool. Sound fair? i'm holding all you right. to it i'm kidding anyway number four this one it does pay me to put this on the list because it's one of the it's one of the first of two i bean local events that i have to put on here but the indianapolis 500 this is one of those things where you know in the state of indiana it's very popular you know we have the indycar hall of, we have the indianapolis 500 hall of fame we've got the racetrack museum but to like people outside the united states when i tell them on memorial day weekend and i'm going to be glued to my television watching cars go 285 miles an hour around a track they just look at me like i am crazy they don't get the appeal of the indianapolis 500 and it's even but it's weirdly popular in Europe where like IndyCar type stuff is more popular. Grand Prix stuff is more popular. So I look at the Indianapolis 500 and it used to be like on four or five local radio channels. And now it's down to like two and they're the ones based in Indianapolis. And I really hate to see that because there are so many good stories that come out of the Indianapolis 500 every year that I really want it to stick around and be more relevant than it is. But alas, as time rolls on, people care less and less about old traditional sports as we're about to see. And it's really hard to make IndyCar like more exciting. You really can't change the rules. You can't make the cars go faster. They're already going as fast as they can go. That's physically possible. So you got to do, you got to roll with the punches. And it, re it really sucks because it's an international sport. I mean, look at what Elio Castroneves, he won the, he won it this year. He's, he's got an international market who loves him. Will Power, a driver from New Zealand, won it a year ago. So there's an international market here. It's just in the United States where you have NASCAR, where you have so many other things to do on Memorial Day weekend and your Sunday that uh, people just don't get into it anymore. 
So number four, the Indianapolis 500, an American tradition that's sadly kind of losing its luster a bit as we progress towards more and more sports content. I don't have anything to say about that, but my girlfriend might because her and her family go every year. <laughs> she says she's good. So. <laughs> I love IndyCar. Don't get me wrong. I'm watching that every week, every Memorial Day weekend. I love it. I just wish more people loved it because it's a great race. It's it's tradition. It's better than a Kentucky Derby. Come at me. Come at me, Twitter. Come at whoa, me everywhere. Whoa, 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 Okay, number three, and this one also pains me because it's another sport I love dearly, but the World Series. No, no. And I know it still does fairly well in the ratings, but that's mostly from people like my dad and other old men watching the World Series because they still love baseball. I sadly think that if you took a picture of Mike Trout to your local elementary school and showed it to the kids and asked them, hey, kids, who is this man? They would probably say he was like the new Mr. Clean or something because no one can identify Mike Trout. Baseball, in spite of its best efforts, is continuing to fall off, but there are signs of hope because that Field of Dreams game, in spite of the fact Field of Dreams is a horrible movie and I hate it. (laughs) Sorry, Ray Liotta. It was one of the most exciting and interesting events I had seen all flipping year. I love even it even made Joe Buck excited and nothing makes Joe Buck excited. So I think maybe the MLB is going to learn a lesson from the success of that field of dreams game and keep working it and stuff like that, doing things that are interesting, moving the game around a little bit. But the World Series, I asked my friends last year who was in the World Series and granted there was COVID. They couldn't tell me and the freaking Dodgers were in the World Series. We're not talking about a small market team. We're talking about L.A.'s team. And, I mean, when the Washington Nationals won it, nobody could tell me anything about the Washington Nationals. When I did the sports show at IUS and it was the World Series, they were just like, Matt, don't talk about baseball. We don't know anything about baseball. So I think from being like the great American pastime, the sporting event where, like, the world stopped for, like, Murderer's Row and the Yankees and the Big Red Machine and – George Brett, 1985's Kansas City Royals and everything in between that I really can't believe. My dad still can't believe that baseball has kind of fallen into like this weird state of being not irrelevant, but not discussed. But the good news is that I see signs of life with baseball and I just saw them this weekend. But just for the lack of public awareness, I got to put the World Series in number three because there are a lot of people who just don't know. They don't care. Baseball is a boring old man sport. So that's why it's number three on my list. And I have a couple things to say about what you just said. Matt is continuing his trend on just bashing popular sports movies as he's done many times on this podcast. What? That movie makes no sense. Is the cornfield magic? Why do these people want to drive to Iowa to play baseball? Because if you build it, they will come. That's dumb advice. I could build a McDonald's in my house and no one's going to come to it. Well, that's I mean, because I guess McDonald's is bad for you. People still eat it. That's fair, but it's I mean, bad for I, you. And I know the point of the movie is like, it's part of like resolving the trauma within and, you know, he plays catch with his dad as like, but I mean, the logic of that world just totally confused me. It was a movie that went for the heartstrings and just made my logic just completely fall apart. So I love Ray Liotta, but Ray Liotta should only be in Goodfellas, damn it. Goodfellas, which is a great movie. I also want to add the Field of Dreams game was awesome. It was. And even if you're not a baseball fan, you got to respect the Field of Dreams game. It, and of course, of course, with the ending of that game, too, you can't beat it. Cannot Tim Anderson, oof, just a great way to end that. It would be great if the White Sox went on to win the World Series and they're like, well, what change turned your season around? The Field of Dreams game. That would be one of the best storylines for sports writers in baseball. And the last thing I'm going to add to this point before you move on to your, num- uh, to your next 
sporting event is that I thought baseball had started to gain momentum with the We Play Loud movement, you know, with the more exciting and like them kind of starting to back off a little bit about certain traditions and letting players have a little more attitude. And I think we see that with guys like Fernando Tatis and all them, which who I absolutely love watching the watching play the game. And I'm glad he's back and he hit two home runs yesterday and it was awesome. In but, right field. Yeah. So yes. But um yeah, I thought the we play loud movement, I think even helps a little bit to that, uh to baseball regaining some life. But uh yeah, it's I think I agree with what you're saying. And I think it's a shame because baseball is just such a great sport. And I uh it's sad for that some people just don't have the same interest in it. Which is really what makes my number two also pretty sad because I remember hearing from my dad and my even my grandmother how great this next sport was and how horridly represented it is now. And that's number two, boxing. Gone are the days of Muhammad Ali. Gone are the days of Mike Tyson. Gone are the days of Rocky Marciano. There are Jack Johnson. They're the number one ranked boxer in the world, probably, if you ask most kids, is Logan Paul, for Pete's sake. He probably had the most interesting fight of the year against Floyd Mayweather, who's a retired, out-of-shape guy who's most famous now for fighting Manny Pacquiao past his prime, the Paul brothers, one of them, and Conor McGregor, who's an MMA fighter. And if those are the most three most popular fights of the decade for boxing, boxing needs help. There are, are no more superstars in boxing, you know? To the average person there there are no muhammad ali's there's not even like a buster douglas or a evander holyfield there's no one left they had i'm gonna butcher his name and i apologize they had vladimir klitschko for a while but even he that's not a household name in america tyson fury's not a household name in america boxing is now more of a novelty than it is an actual sport and it's a damn shame because like i said you have these fake fights you have jake paul boxing who is that guy, KSI or something? I don't even know who the hell KSI is. I don't know who he is, but he's boxing Jake Paul. And, you know, if that's the way that Jake Paul can make money, more power to him, you know? I'm not against that. What I'm, a, what I'm complaining about is the fact that, like, boxing, the beautiful, athletic, strategic sport that, you know, was played by the greatest athletes in American history, smoking Joe Frazier, George Foreman, Ali, it's gone. It's gone. That's, that's the only way to say it. It's gone. And I know that sport is violent, and I know that sport is also very brutal, and it requires a lot of head damage. But just seeing, like, this, boxers used to be spokesmen for the generation or, like, spokesmen for their communities. And even civil rights icons, even before Muhammad Ali, guys like Jack Johnson. Mm -hmm. And now it's just, like, a non-existent sport that's dominated by celebrity boxing with, like, Lamar Odom. And I forgot who he boxed, but he boxed, like, some guy from NSYNC. And it's, like... This is what the sport has become, and it, it makes me sad because I would love nothing more than to actually buy a pay-per-view fight, but I can't bring myself to it because no one intrigues me enough to do so, and so that's why boxing's number two. I just can't imagine the sport rebounding. It needs someone, and it needs them like five years ago, especially in this world where you can literally watch anything at your fingertips, any sport, but it pains there did it freeze on you yeah it froze for a second do i need to say anything again or <laughs> no i mean it, it just i think you concluded your point and then it froze but um no and um matt help me out with this one but what's the real famous boxing magazine uh oh man it's not southpaw southpaw used to be I don't even remember anymore, really. I haven't looked at one in so long. I'll say, um, well, I where I'm going with this is I almost saw the writing on the wall. I think it was back in 2014 when Ronda Rousey, a female MMA fighter, made the cover of one of the most popular boxing magazines. And like you mentioned, and kind of like you bring up Floyd Mayweather earlier in the segment, Floyd Mayweather made a great point by saying, you know, the sport of boxing is going downhill when an MMA fighter is making the cover of, the, of a boxing magazine. And he's right. Mm -hmm. But I think enough for controversy with boxing. I think your number one pick is the most controversial of all, especially given the region we live in. 
Oh, yeah, it's time. Number one, horse racing. I don't think people realize that there was a time, especially in our area, when horse racing was called the sport of kings. And Seabiscuit and Secretariat and God knows who else were winning the Triple Crown. And it was good times all across the country. The nation paused when the Kentucky Derby was held. And now it's just something we use as an excuse to get drunk for two weeks. Let's be honest. I mean, I, even when American Pharaoh won the Triple Crown, I can't recall anybody like exactly losing their mind over the way that horse was dominating the field, like Secretariat, like a Seabiscuit type story. There was nothing like that. And I mean, horse racing has its issues. There, the, the treatment of jockeys, the treatment of the animals, gambling, things like that. It has its issues. And, and mint juleps also suck. Let's not kid ourselves. That's the worst alcohol I've ever had. Mint juleps. Damn. I love awesome. mint juleps. Love them. I'm, I'm leaving the show. I, I can't deal with these kind of conditions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But my, I hate mint juleps. And, you know, in our area especially, I look at, like, once again, the attitudes of the younger generations towards the Kentucky Derby, where, you know, it used to be a party that we would celebrate for two weeks, and there were fireworks, and people were riding beds for some reason. Still don't <laughs> get that. And now, it's like, we have, we all, we've all become so jaded that we have the Hunter S. Thompson view of it, which is the Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved, which in some ways it is. Let's not kid ourselves. We can't kid that every event has a dark underbelly that we wish didn't exist, but we know it does. But back to the national scale, these horses are no longer national names. There's more, and especially with the recent controversies about this year's Derby winner when the drugs and all that stuff, it's not been a great time for horse racing. You had that weird disqualification a couple years ago. You had the former President Trump calling a horse a junkie and misspelling junkie this year. Uh, horse racing is in a bad way. And, and I can't say that that's another example of things moving forward, you know, as a, as a culture, as a nation, as a, as a world society almost, that nobody really cares about how hard you can whip a horse anymore because the horses are the real athletes there. They're bred to be winners. And, you know, we just don't care about that anymore. It's like, we think it's cruel and unusual to do that to an animal, right? Wrong and different. So horse racing to me, it used to be, you could get the front covers. Any horse that won a race was like a hero. And now it's like a lot of times once the Preakness is over and the horse person wins a derby didn't win, you could care less. You don't, you just don't care anymore. Whereas it used to be people care about every race, regardless of who was racing. There was big, there was, big appeal in going to the track and now it's just it appeals to this area of the country the same way the indianapolis 500 does and a lot of younger people in this area are even turning against it so my number one the horse racing not specifically the kentucky derby but the horse racing industry in general it just doesn't have the same prestige it used to have back in the 1970s even so yeah that's my list only in Kentucky where you can party for two weeks for a two-minute horse race. That's all I'm going to exactly. say. I'm going to end on that. But I, I think that is going to wrap up the show for this week. Matt and I had a lot to say this week, so I'm sure you all have a lot to say in the comment section. But be sure, if you like the content, to like, subscribe, and subscribe to the, the Less Is More Sports YouTube channel. But that's all the time we have for today. It's uh, Matt and I are out. See ya.